UConn is the greatest basketball program of all time. It's not close. You're locked on UConn. You are locked on UConn, your daily podcast on the UConn Huskies, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On UConn your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts on YouTube and part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Well, we talk a lot in sports media about who's the GOAT, right? Which era of player is your GOAT? Is it Jordan, Kobe, Kareem, LeBron? My dad would say Pistol Pete when he was a kid, uh, Larry Bird. Magic Johnson. Now on the women's side, you have Caitlin Clark is the new darling and flavor of the month, debating her against the likes of Candace Parker, Shamiqua Holdscall, Diana Taurasi, Maya Moore, Brianna Stewart, and more. Cheryl Miller, Nancy Lieberman, if you're one of the old heads, like myself. Um, Cheryl Swoops, you know, we can really go back. But the one thing that is unquestioned is the Connecticut basketball program. Men and women combined is the greatest college basketball program of all time. And it's not particularly close. Let's dive into some numbers. Just on sheer volume of titles alone, the women have 11. The next closest is Tennessee at eight. So unless Rick Barnes and company went off, you know, seven or eight titles in a row, they're not even in that conversation for the men and the women. On the men's side, we have, we have five titles. UConn, tied for the fourth all-time with Duke and Indiana. This coming weekend, both programs are gunning for more history. The women searching for number 12 in an upstart way, and the men looking for their second consecutive win and cementing their place in basketball history as just, just the eighth team ever to, to go back-to-back. -back. First one since 06-07 Florida. Only other programs who have won both the men and women's sides are Baylor, North Carolina, and UConn. And really, the Baylor women's team is the last one that have won close together, 2019, 2021. Carolina men won in 2017. The last women's title was 1994. We're going for our third double dip national championship. 04 in 2014. Seems like years that end in four are pretty lucky for both of our teams. So 2024 looks like it should be no different. The other amazing tidbit is UConn's men and women have been winning titles at an alarming rate compared to other teams since 1995. When you research this on your own, you see a whole lot of titles, especially on the men's side, when the tournament was smaller more selective, and frankly, at the time, when the game wasn't showcase showcasing its top talents, top athletes. Gino Oriema is the unquestioned greatest coach of all time on the women's side. UConn's Dan Hurley would enter an elite group of coaches with multiple national titles, joining a club with names Dean Smith, Denny Crum, Bill Self, and Jay Wright. So while national media talks about, well, so while the national media talks about Who's the GOAT in the NBA, in women's college basketball? And then they try to manufacture this idea that somehow that the thriving women's game is at the expense of the men's game. While that's happening, the people of Connecticut and its fans spread across this great country and globally sit and laugh. In 1995, the men were good, but the women were transcendent. And since then, it's almost like it's been an arms race. Who can win more titles? And early on in the women's game, the parody hasn't always been there. So to, to credit to Gino and his staff, they, they created this standard that they had to, that the rest of the game had to catch up to. And honestly, the standard before UConn started this incredible run from the women's side, that villain was Tennessee and Pat Summit. That was the standard in, in women's college basketball. And UConn was the upstart, the brash young Italian head coach from the Northeast that was fast-talking and no-nonsense, 
going against the matriarch of women's college basketball. UConn is typically the villain now on the women's side and will be the next game against Iowa because the nothing the media wants more and really national folks, whether it's Fox, whether it's ESPN, they want nothing more than to keep writing this Caitlin Clark story. It's not going to be rigged. It's not fixed. She's not being propped up. She is a phenomenal player, but they are rooting for her. Make no mistake about it. Brought Entities like Fox and ESPN want storylines. They don't care who the best team is. They want storylines so that they can create these 24-7 you know, sports talk shows, first take, undisputed. They are 100% rooting for this storyline because it just adds to their content. Hopefully UConn can wreck that. But they're not going to be the villain always because they could face, if they do beat Iowa and Caitlin Clark, they could face an undefeated South Carolina team in the title game. Dawn Staley's group is undefeated and really looking for revenge from last year's loss in the national semifinals. On the men's side, what Jim Calhoun built and passed the, the torch to Kevin Ollie and now to Dan Hurley feels like the men are entering their villain phase. UConn Twitter is obnoxious as shh, as Dan Hurley says, and his staff recognizes it. And some fans from opposing teams typically take these L's on social media and also on the court. We're becoming the standard of college basketball, and if we win back-to-back, it'll cement it. What I find so interesting about the differences between the men and the women's game from a UConn perspective is I think there's always going to be forces that try to pit the genders against each other, men versus women. Can such and such player compete on in the NBA? Um, is is Paige Beckers better than, you know, name a basketball player? That's something that I, I personally have not witnessed a lot in terms of my own interaction with UConn fans. Are there some men who don't watch the women? Yes. Are there some women who don't watch the men? Yes. They're largely different sports. The ball is different. The way that the, even the way the game is played is different. And I mean that from an operational standpoint, the men play halves, the women play quarters. It's more of that kind of international and NBA style game. Um, I personally think the flow of the game works better in quarters. And I'd love to see the men adopt a four quarter philosophy in the future, because it also gives you a different strategy in terms of following. Um, you know, I think I, I, maybe I'm wrong about this, but you know, the men, seven fouls is one and one, 10, 10 fouls is, is two shots. I believe the women is like the NBA. Like once you get to three fouls in a quarter, you're shooting one and one. Um, I'd, I'd much rather see that because you'd see um, guys like Dan Hurley, who are tacticians and really manage the game well, use that to their advantage. Um, to use an old reference from, our, you know, the 1990 team, at that time, the Big East tried this six foul um, experimentation for Big East conference games. And Calhoun used that to his advantage. They pressed unmercilessly. And if they got in foul trouble, it didn't matter because they had an extra one to play with. So I'd like to see where where the, the men's game could go, maybe do some experimental tournaments initially to do some four quarters. They play college uh, high school basketball as four quarters. I don't understand why it's a it's a half and half, but that's that's here nor there. Um, the crux of the matter is UConn men and women have created the greatest basketball utopia of all time on the college game. And like I said, it's not particularly close. We are truly the basketball capital of the world. And it's not changing anytime soon. Let's move on. And just when we think it's really just ourselves, I listened, I wrote, a, I didn't write, I, I, I read a piece by the great John Fanta and we'll talk about what he wrote and what he, his perspective after this. The Fire TV stick was my first venture into the streaming platforms. Now on Fire TV, 
is your ultimate destination for sports, offering live games, highlights, and in-depth analysis. With Fire TV, you get amazing viewing experiences on smart TVs or by simply plugging in the Fire TV stick to your existing setup. Granting access to millions of movies, TV episodes, and even free and live TV, whether it's opening weekend for baseball or right in the middle of the NCAA tournament, Fire TV has you covered. Fire TV recently introduced Fire TV channels, providing a steady stream of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands, all for free. This includes content from all of us at Locked On, as well as major pro leagues and college conferences. Fire TV channels let you dive into the same, it's a game analysis, highlights, and more keeping you up to date on the latest in the sports world from March Madness to the NBA. All right. Thank you to Fire TV. Well, John Fanta is a beloved broadcaster and play-by-play man for Fox Sports. Big East Twitter absolutely adores John Fanta. I love John Fanta. Um, John, if you listen to this, I'm going to tag you in it as well. Loved your piece. Would love to have you on the pod at some point. We had Michael Cohen on at, at, at some point. Um, during during the season when he wrote the piece on UConn's offense. And so this piece was putting UConn's dominant run into perspective. And it was a collection of respected coaches and media personalities, both locally and nationally, talking about how to play UConn. So let's take a look. And again, John, open invite to Locked on UConn. Like we said, we had your colleague Michael Cohen on. Would love to have you. So here's some quotes. Uh, Donnie Marshall. I have my issues with Donnie Marshall. He's a fellow Husky. Um, fantastic job ascending to the world of a color analyst uh, at Fox Sports. I think he did work for ESPN at some point. Don't quote me on that. Um, here's his quote, and I'll, and I'll get into why I have some issues with Donnie. Um, from their unselfishness to their ability to score in the half quarter transition, they have they have it all. One thing Hurley doesn't get enough credit for is his playing and play calling and schemes. We know he's passionate and intense and brings that all out of his players, but he's so great at managing a game too. You can't say enough about, you can't say that enough about most coaches. Hurley and his staff have done something that no championship coaches have ever done. They have recruited four and five star players, but have also brought back guys that you develop while knowing the culture and playing the transfer portal as well as anyone. Now, I agree with that wholeheartedly because, especially with the bringing people back, because in this day and age, I've I've tried to get some guests on who are assistant coaches at other schools. It's impossible. Um, you know, the only coaches who are doing interviews right now are teams that are playing because they're not doing as much behind the scenes stuff. And if you're a coach on a team that's not particularly good or you haven't had success, it's even harder to get coaches like that because they're working 24-7, 365 to try to get transfer guys in to recruit guys, uh, to show them NIL possibilities. So it's a really interesting dynamic that UConn has created to, you know, to really keep guys, but also recruit at the at the highest of levels. And remembering back to Michael Cohen's piece, finding the right guys. You just don't want a collection of talent. You want to meld these guys as a team. Finding these guys, these processors, these brain center guys like Alex Caravan. Um and, and this is nothing personal against Donnie Marshall. I, he's one of my favorite players uh, watching him when I was a kid. I think he does a good job at his, you know, overall. But just some of the stuff he says, I, I almost, it reminds me of, I, I'm, and I'm, I don't like this player at all. I like Donnie Marshall, so don't get me wrong. It's a, it's a, it's a f- unfair comparison, but it, it reminds me of it. Alex Rodriguez is, either loved or hated by Yankee fans and mostly hated by baseball fans in general. But he's tried this kind of endearing thing at Fox where he does play by where he does games. And whenever he calls Yankee games, he goes over the top to criticize Yankee players. And I think he does it because he doesn't want to be perceived as a homer. So I say that to say that Donnie Marshall goes over the top to commend other teams and doesn't give the credit he just gave to Dan Hurley in this article on air to not be perceived as a homer. It's like, buddy, we all know that you went to UConn and I'm not saying you're bad at your job. I just think that there needs to be a little more less company man in Donnie Marshall in terms of, you know, in particular, a a game that comes to mind was the Providence um, UConn game with him and Tim Brando. 
Uh, shout out my my man Chris Smith. He got all he got Tim Brando all riled up because he you know made some mistakes during that game, and Tim Brando was just like you know kind of dismissed him really disrespectfully. But Donnie Marshall was no better in that game. You know, called the game beautifully officiated. It was the worst game I've watched in ten years in terms of just being able to watch the game. So I I put Donnie Marshall's quote first because I wanted to get that out of the way. Love Donnie Marshall, but man, just do better, man. Like I, I you know, we we as UConn fans love that you're you call our games, but it's starting to be like when I see he's on the call, it's like, well, we're gonna get a few, you know, 10, 12 comments where um the other team is very good. Even when we're winning by 20, 30 points, or how great the officials are when you know Don McLean gets two fouls right away. So anyway, that's my beef with Donnie Marshall. No big deal. Donnie, come on the show. You know, talk, talk, uh, talk back to me. I'll probably never get Donnie Marshall on, but that's okay. No disrespect to him, but are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Have to turn down the volume with all that shouting. Make the switch to Locked On Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel program for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports today brings you can't miss analysis, opinions, and news, streaming 24-7 on YouTube. And for free, uh, Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I did my uh, best Bill Burr impression there um, when he does his ads, all, all for free. Um, <laughs> some other quotes from John Fanta's piece about a perspective of playing them. I thought Sean Miller's was pretty pretty dynamic. This year's UConn team is the best team I've ever coached against. Very high praise. Um, this was also a great quote in, in that, and I, I couldn't agree more. The combination of Samson Johnson and Donovan Klingon on defense gives them both depth and two different styles of defense. Remember that as we play these next two games. Yes, we are playing two more games. Whether we're playing this Bama team that likes to run track, as we're seeing on, on social media, or we're playing more of a traditional post-presence team where we're going to have to maybe not double uh, ED and, and also hedge, hedge screens when Samson comes in. Their guards have great experience and size, and they they play – they play these two styles of defenses at the five position, and it makes them almost impossible to prepare for, especially in a short period of time, because they they flip a switch. When Donovan's in, they play one style. When Samson's in, they play another. Um, and then Sean also said they remind me of, of many of the great Duke teams ugh, under Mike Krzyzewski with Shane Bettier, Mike Dunleavy and company. They play with great confidence, energy, and togetherness. I have respect for those Duke teams. I don't like Duke. In fact, I hate Duke. It's okay. I my favorite thing is when Duke players, Duke uh, fans say, you know, why is UConn so obsessed with Duke? Hey guys, you guys were the villain in the early '90s. You beat us at the buzzer one time when we would have gotten to the Final Four. It's okay to not like you. No, it, when you love when you love Duke, why wouldn't you want to be the team that everyone hates? Because I love that you, everyone is starting to kind of look at UConn as this villain. That's okay. But we're still going to always have our our you know our lights that we look at, and you know and and say that that's a team that you grew up hating. Just because the Red Sox win the World Series doesn't mean doesn't mean that I'm I have to like the Red Sox. I'm I'm a, I'm a Yankee fan. Well, I you know I can respect them. I'm just not going to love the Red Sox. Um, you know, do, am I going to all of a sudden like Providence because? They, they, you know, they have some good players. Get out of here! It's, it's, it's the, it's the dumbest thing of all time. We don't worry about you, but you've beaten us in the past, and now we're kind of taking, taking it over. Um, some other great quotes from Rick Pitino and Kim English. Um, and, and to, speaking of Providence, they're the best team we've ever seen. This is Kim English. I've been in college basketball since 2008. They're potent, intelligent, selfless, run such well-executed offense. They're tough as nails, connected and have well-organized defense, too. They're so relentless on the glass and are as connected as a team can be. Um, Rick Pitino also said, so thank you, Kim English in Providence uh, Nation. Rick Pitino said, I think Connecticut, what I'm most appreciative of and respect is that is most is when they became number one in the country, how focused they were to maintain their excellence. And that's a great point because they did go on a run there where they didn't lose until they played Creighton on the road. That's also being used again Something silly that's being said on social media is that, well, you know, UConn's losses have come at, um, by double digits. UConn doesn't lose on the uh, in neutral site games or at home. Just just so we're clear on that. 
So everybody that's talking about the Creighton loss, the Kansas loss, or the Seton Hall loss, congrats on Seton Hall getting to the finals of the NIT. You got robbed. You should have been in the NCAA tournament. Um, those are silly comparisons. Um, it's 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 just there's just there's just there's no data to to show that UConn in a neutral site game is, has ever lost in the last ten NCAA tournament games. I think they're 24 and 24, 25 and one in their last neutral site games. So good luck with that. Um, my favorite quote of all of this is from Chris Collins because he kind of gave himself a little humble brag. So I'm going to read it to you and then you tell, I think you'll see where I, where I smile on this is where I, uh, where I, I noticed he was just kind of like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good too. They have five guys. This is Chris Collins, Northwestern head coach. We beat in the second round by 17. They have five guys who can all score. They are very athletic. I was very impressed in person with their defense. I knew how prolific they were offensively, but seeing in person their attention to detail defensively, the rotation, sticking on Boo Booey, sticking on Ryan Langborn, making it harder on all of our guys. Donovan Klingon had eight blocks, and his presence in the lane alone was amazing. You know, they have all the ingredients to win another championship. There's no question about it. Obviously, the tournament, you have to bring it every night. But Danny is such a good coach. I have so much respect for him what he's built there. I've talked about it in the last couple of days. I th I think he and I are a lot alike in a lot of ways. The way we do things and how we coach and how we see the game. I know he's going to have these guys ready to go. I know how he's wired. So to answer your question, a team is going to have to play really, really, really well to beat them. Respect Chris Collins. I I, sh I loved the emotion he showed when he was you know talking to his senior players uh, when they were when they were getting ready to lose that game. But I love I love this quote. That quote. I think he and I are a lot alike. You know, I think um, Bradley Cooper and I are a lot alike. It, you know, the difference is he's got a lot more hair. He's skinnier. He's taller and more attractive. Um, but and probably has a lot more money. So um, maybe more talented. That's <laughs> just. It's just. I mean it. And I understand the comparison because they're both coaches, and I and I get it. But that just that that made me laugh. That made me laugh. Um, and lastly, before we move on to the next segment, um, Jay Wright, Jay Wright loves Dan Hurley. That he knew him when he was a kid. UConn has the best backcourt in the country. They have the second best center in the nation. He is the best defensive center in the sport, bar, bar none. They have a lottery pick in Stefan Castle. Absolutely, they have a deep bench, and they beat you and are relentlessly competitive on every possession, not on talent. They wear you down possession after possession. Are you listening, Alabama fans? They wear you down possession after possession. So all of that running you want to do may not be what you think you're going to be able to do. And especially when they get a... This is, again, to go back to Jay Wright's post. When they get a lead, they never relent. They just continue to compete on every possession. They're the most disciplined team in the country. They might be one of the best to ever play when it's all said and done, 1990 UNLV, 96 Kentucky, the great Duke's te Duke teams, and even my team in 2018, if they finish as I think they will, their run could be one of the most dominant ever. Does that mean we're a shoe in Yes, it does. Um, see, guys, it's not just us. Fanta has called us an avalanche. I call this quicksand. We're a lot of things to different people, but what we know is we are a championship club, and that's been built on championship culture. And before someone questions that, like, well, he's only Dan Hurley's only won one title. I'll tell you where it starts. It started in Jersey City, St. Anthony's High School, 26 state, state championships. Bob Sr. would bring his sons, Dan and Bobby, and enduring those practices and Dan taking that mentality and getting his players to embrace that culture over and over and over again in pursuit for, of this greatness for UConn. We're going to talk about my top five moments in UConn Final Four history coming up. The sports calendar is loaded and FanDuel is making it even more exciting to get in on the action because right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with, with any winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks you can use to bet the tourney MLB, NBA, NHL, and so much more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a big win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. 
Well, we'll end the show with my top five moments in UConn Final Four history. Let's count it down from five. Number five, 35 and 0, 1995 national title. UConn defeats Tennessee in their arch nemesis for their first national title. I was at my parents' house in Meriden, Connecticut, 14 years old, sophomore in high school. Yes, I was a young sophomore. Was a great moment for the state of Connecticut. And I just remember how great that game was back and forth. Rebecca Lobo, um, just, just a phenomenal, phenomenal group of, of gals that won that first title, the first of many to come. Number four on my list, 1999. Not what you're going to think it is. The Final Four National Semifinal versus Ohio State. It's a singular play that sticks in my mind. Khalid Alamine's behind-the-back transition pass to Kevin Freeman. I was at a friend's house, Tim Redican, house in, in, in Meriden, Connecticut. I jumped out of my chair. Would, would be an incredible all-time highlight if Kevin Freeman could have powered through and dunked it, but he got hit on that arm. The ball still trickled through for the three-point play in an and one. Number three on my list, the 2003 national title game, Diana Taurasi led the UConn women to their second straight title in a win over arch nemesis Tennessee again. 28 points for Taurasi. This was my probably the my uh the my least favorite year. My, oh, sorry. This is my last year of college. So apologies for not knowing exactly the details of my whereabouts. Um I just remember it being uh I, I won't go there. I think my my parents probably I'm watching this and realize that uh College might have been a big waste of time for me. Um, number two, 2004. Both the men and women win the title. The men dominating Georgia Tech. They were up by almost 30 at that point. That was another one of those 2004 dominant runs where they were just killing teams. And I think they won that Georgia Tech game by eight, kind of got close towards the end. And the women over Tennessee, again, my wife probably won't like how much I've mentioned Tennessee in a bad way today, but I'm sorry. That was that was the times. And finally, for me, number one, 1999, the UConn men win their first national title. title. My, my senior year in high school, Duke had been the dominant force that season. Coming into that game, they were 37-1. and one. But just like in many years before, we, we felt overlooked. We had an All-American in Rip Hamilton a nice hefty point guard that I related to in Khalid El Amin. Tried to mimic his shot with that elbow out. Um, Ricky Moore, cutting the head off the snake, just his effort on defense. Kevin Freeman, just an absolute glue guy. Um, in a way, he reminds me of um, like, a, 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 like a bigger um, Alex Caravan. Jake Boskel. What can you say about Jake? He was an underrated part of that team was such a good defensive presence, wasn't a great shot blocker, but he was tough to play against. Suleiman Juan, just listen, he's a guy who developed over time that I know Calhoun was so proud of. Um, and if we ever get him on the show, I'm going to ask him that question. Like, I feel like Suleiman Juan had, a, you know, wasn't always the best player on the court, very likely was never. And he played such a pivotal part of, playing defending Elton Brand in that game. Rashamel Jones, a senior on that team, um, you know, was going through the trials and tribulations of not making it to this point, got his moment. I think he had eight points in the final game. I can look that up, but he was, you know, he, he gave them some big minutes and some and some good stuff. Another one, um, Waterbury's own, I think it's Waterbury, Edmund Saunders. Just, again, another great contributor was Connecticut High School Player of the Year, I believe. Antrick Kleber. One of the all-time name uh, greatest names in UConn history, Andrew Kleber. I loved him. Albert Mooring. Um, just the the names on that team, I remember so much. Um, this team in particular, I used to. I, I won the Connecticut High School State Championship in 1999, and so this team. I said to there was an article written about me in the in the spring. So it was later that you know I think a couple weeks later, um, where I ended up winning it before going off into the summer. They, the local paper, the record journal, John Pettit wrote a story and, and asked me what I thought about, you know, me winning. And I said, I, I equated to UConn uh, men's basketball, which is I lost in the quarterfinals, which is what have been the elite eight the year before in 98 as a junior. And I just worked my butt off all year 
to get to, into a position where I was going to be the best in the state. And in this case, UConn was the best in the country, right? And so I'll never forget that. It was a really amazing run for me personally. But I felt like that kind of team was like a kindred spirit of mine. Um, that song, um, it sounds so silly because we're, you know, white kids in the suburb playing um, playing tennis. But we used to play that uh, DMX song, Rough Riders Anthem, like going into on the bus to, to go to, to, to matches. Um, so, yes, we're the toughest tennis team in the world. Uh, I remember running upstairs, hugging my parents, much like I did in the Tate George shot in 1990. But this was so much sweeter because it was our first championship. So that is by far my number one moment in UConn men's Final Four history, UConn Final Four history in general. Send me your memories at LockedOnUConn at gmail.com. I'll share them on an upcoming episode. Looking forward to the next couple of days when we have some great uh, guests coming on. We'll get you prepared to go to battle in Phoenix and Cleveland. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube, and now it's also available on Amazon Fire TV in the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with local experts of Locked On, plus our national uh, shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. This has been another episode of Locked On UConn. I'm your host, Mark Zanetto. Stay connected, stay together, keep that toughness meter rising, and as always, go Huskies.